Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ukraine's military says Russian forces are very far from seizing the eastern town of Bakhmut after Russia's Wagner mercenary group said Sunday it raised the Russian flag over the decimated city's administration building. This followed a weekend of heavy fighting in Bakhmut and other parts of eastern Ukraine. In the nearby town of Kostiantivka, at least six people were reported killed from Russian shelling. This is a 69-year-old survivor. Me and my neighbor ran out to the hallway, and we hugged each other very tightly. She's bigger than me, and I hugged her very tight, and we stood there while everything was shaking because of the explosions. I have no idea we have survived. There were six casualties. Six people just died. In Russia. Authorities say they arrested a woman, Daria Trepova, in connection with a bombing Sunday, which killed the prominent pro-war military blogger Vladlin Tatarsky in St. Petersburg. The Russian ambassador to Belarus said Moscow will station tactical nuclear weapons near Belarus's western border with NATO nations. NATO members will meet this week in Brussels, including Finland, which will officially become the newest member of the military alliance Tuesday. Meanwhile, Russia has assumed the presidency of the U.N. Security Council for the month in a move blasted by Ukraine, as President Volodymyr Zelensky accused the body of bankruptcy, the last time Russia held the rotating presidency was in February of 2022, the month it invaded Ukraine. In Finland, the prime minister, Sanna Marin, has conceded after her center-left Social Democratic Party came in third in Sunday's election behind right-wing nationalist rivals. The National Coalition Party, Finland's main conservative party, won the most votes, though not enough to rule on its own, and will have to form a coalition government. The NCP ran on promises of fixing the economy. A series of severe storms fueled an estimated 11 tornadoes across the southern and midwestern U.S. over the weekend, killing at least 32 people. At least one million customers lost power. Homes, businesses, other structures were destroyed or badly damaged in states including Arkansas, Alabama, Indiana, Mississippi, Tennessee and Iowa. An Arkansas high school teacher surveyed the damage in her classroom Sunday. I've taught here 25 years, and this is my classroom. And when I walked out yesterday, I didn't realize that would be the last time I would teach in this classroom. We got out at 1.30, which was such a God blessing from our superintendent, because otherwise kids would have been on buses and teachers would have still been here. And, and so that would have been even more devastating. More severe weather in the affected regions is forecast this week, as scientists in the Biden administration warn such events are worsening in gravity and frequency. In Afghanistan, the Taliban has shut down a woman-run radio station for broadcasting songs and music during the month of Ramadan. Sadaya Banawan, which means women's voice in Dari, was the only station led by women founded a decade ago. It's the latest rights attack from the Taliban, as women and girls have also been banned from education beyond the sixth grade and most jobs, with the United Nations warning the growing discrimination and systemic violence may amount to gender persecution a crime against humanity. Israeli police shot and killed a Palestinian man at the entrance to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Israeli-occupied East Jerusalem Saturday. Witnesses say soldiers fired more than 20 rounds in less than a minute after the man tried to prevent police from harassing a woman who they'd stopped on her way to the mosque. The victim, 26-year-old Mohammed Khaled Al-Asibi, was a Palestinian citizen of Israel who had just finished medical school. In the occupied West Bank, a Palestinian man was fatally shot by an Israeli soldier hours later near the town of Beit Umar. Witnesses say Israeli forces would not let medics access the injured 24-year-old who bled to death. The killings came as the cabinet of Israel's far-right prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, said it had approved a plan to establish a new National Guard under the control of Itamar Ben-Gavir, Israel's ultra-nationalist national security minister, who once was convicted of racist incitement against Palestinians and supporting a terrorist group in Syria. 
State media is reporting that Israeli strikes on Homs province wounded five Syrian soldiers early Sunday. It was at least the ninth airstrike by Israel inside Syria since the start of the year. In Iran, police have arrested a mother and daughter after a viral video showed a man attacking them in a store for not covering their hair in public in the northeastern city of Shandiz. The video shows the man confronting the two women as they wait in line at a shop. The man, who was also apparently later arrested, appears to shout, then pours what appears to be a tub of yogurt over their heads. The women have since been charged with committing a forbidden act and flouting Iran's dress code, which requires women wear a hijab. On Saturday, the Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi, reiterated women must always wear the hijab, calling it a religious necessity. The order came even as millions of Iranian women and girls continue to routinely ignore the requirement, especially in Iran's big cities. This is Malika, 16-year-old in Tehran. You can't throw a tub of yogurt on a woman's head and think you did something great and to guide someone in the right direction. It's that person's business. She wanted to dress like that, and she dressed however she wanted. It's no one's business. Twitter's billionaire owner, Elon Musk, has ordered the social media platform to remove a badge showing verified status for The New York Times after the paper's editors refused to pay for its Twitter Blue service. This comes after Twitter instituted a pay-for-play system in which companies, nonprofits and government institutions have to pay $1,000 a month to keep check marks showing their accounts have been verified. So far, only a few dozen accounts have seen their badges removed. Musk signaled he'd remove the Times checkmark over its coverage, which he blasted in a tweet as propaganda. Other prominent accounts, reportedly including those of White House staffers, have refused to pay for Twitter Blue. That's led to fears over misinformation and hate speech by imposter accounts on Twitter ahead of the 2024 presidential elections. Donald Trump's 2024 presidential campaign raised over $4 million in 24 hours following the news last week of his indictment by a Manhattan grand jury connected to a 2016 hush money scheme. Trump released a fundraising video Sunday, two days before his expected arraignment in New York. The election was rigged and stolen, but now we're going to take back our country in 2024. If you're doing well because all of the things that I've done have brought you wealth and prosperity, or at least you're extremely comfortable, it would be really great if you could contribute to our campaign. Trump is expected to speak from Mar-a-Lago Tuesday evening following his arraignment. Invitations have already gone out. Over the weekend, Trump lashed out against New York Supreme Court Justice Juan Marchand, who's overseeing his criminal case, claiming he, quote, hates me. It's the same judge who presided over the prosecution of the Trump Organization and CFO Alan Weisselberg. Meanwhile, former Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson announced Sunday he'll run for the Republican presidential nomination. Hutchinson called on Trump to withdraw from the race due to his legal troubles. As Governor Hutchinson signed a trigger law banning abortion in 2019 and made Arkansas the first state to impose work requirements for Medicaid recipients, costing over 18,000 people to access the program before a court blocked their requirement. Millions of U.S. residents are poised to lose Medicaid health insurance as protections put in place at the start of COVID-19 pandemic begin to lapse. Under a bipartisan deal reached by Congress late last year, states are allowed to remove Medicaid recipients from the rolls as early as April 1st, unless they prove they still qualify. Some residents of five states, Arizona, Arkansas, Idaho, New Hampshire and South Dakota, have already been kicked off Medicaid. Part of what the Biden administration estimates will ultimately be 15 million people losing benefits, including millions of children. The FDA has approved the opioid 
or overdose drug Narcan to be sold over the counter. Narcan, a quick-acting Naxalone nasal spray, could become available in pharmacies as well as convenience stores and gas stations by late summer. Opioid overdoses killed over 81,000 people in 2021. It's not yet known how much manufacturer emergent biosolutions will charge for Narcan. Advocates are calling for the life-saving drug to be distributed for free. Democratic Senator John Fetterman of Pennsylvania has checked out of Walter Reed Hospital after receiving inpatient treatment for depression since mid-February. Fetterman is scheduled to return to the Senate April 17th, after the two-week holiday recess. In a statement, Senator Fetterman urged others with mental health challenges to seek help. He spoke candidly about his depression during an interview on CBS's Sunday morning. It's like you just won the biggest, you know, race in, in the country. And the whole thing about depression is, is that objectively you may have won, but de depression can actually convince you that you actually lost. And that's exactly what happened. And that was the start of a, of a, down, a downward spiral. Senator Fetterman had a stroke while he was running for the Senate against Mehmet Oz, but still won. California will require half of all heavy trucks sold by 2035 to be electric as it moves to phase out diesel trucks. The Environmental Protection Agency on Friday granted waivers for California to set its own truck pollution standards that are stricter than federal ones. Last year, California passed a measure requiring all new passenger vehicles sold to be fully electric by 2035. Transportation accounts for some 40 percent of California's greenhouse gas emissions. Supporters of political prisoner Mumia Abu-Jamal are raising alarm after a judge on Friday denied his request for a new trial. Philadelphia Judge Lucretia Clemens dismissed evidence the case was tainted by judicial bias, police and prosecutorial misconduct, and that key witnesses were bribed or coerced. Mumia Abu-Jamal is 68 years old. He suffers from numerous health problems. The journalist and former Black Panther has maintained his innocence for the four decades he's been in prison after being convicted of murdering a police officer. A federal court blocked Tennessee's highly contested law targeting drag performance on Friday, just hours before it would have gone into effect. The temporary injunction came in response to a lawsuit filed by LGBTQ group Friends of Georgia's, which argued the legislation is overly broad and violates the First Amendment. The measure is the second major legislative attack on the trans community in Tennessee. The state also banned gender-affirming health care for trans youth last month. And queer and trans youth-led actions across the United States Friday, marking International Transgender Day of Visibility and amid intensifying discrimination, violence and anti-trans laws pushed by Republicans. Here in New York, hundreds took to the streets in a march organized by NYC Youth for Trans Rights. Democracy Now! producers Tamari Astudio and Maria Tarasena were there and spoke to 17-year-old Raven. It's so amazing to look around and see people like me that have had the same experiences as me, who know what it's like to be trans. And it's so great to just, you know, watch everybody be happy and be themselves in a safe place. I'm the happiest I've been in a really, really long time here in this space with these people. And I think that it's so good for people who think that they're alone to know that they have people out there, people fighting for them, people fighting with them, people on their side. Because, like, a lot of them just don't have that. They go through so, so, so much. And the gathering around, being able to look at people and hug people and talk to people that are like them is something that can really heal a heart. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Coming up, the nation's justice correspondent, Ellie Mistal on Donald Trump's indictment, his coming to New York today, his arrest tomorrow, and much more. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. On Tuesday, former President Donald Trump is expected to be arraigned in New York on undisclosed charges related to paying hush money to adult film star Stormy Daniels during the 2016 presidential campaign, just before Election Day. Trump will become the first former U.S. president to ever be charged with a crime. 
He's reportedly facing about 30 criminal counts related to business fraud, but Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg has yet to release the exact charges. The charges reportedly include at least one felony. Many expect many more. Trump's indictment comes as he is campaigning again for the 2024 presidential race. He has reportedly raised over $4 million in campaign donations since the indictment was announced. It was reported that he raised $4 million in the first 24 hours and then another at least a million since. On Friday, Trump decried the indictment as a, quote, witch hunt and attacked Judge Juan Mershon, claiming that he, quote, hates me. Mershon had previously presided over the trials of the Trump Organization and CFO Alan Weisselberg, who remains in prison today. Police in New York have already barricaded the court building and Trump Tower ahead of the possible protests. Republican Congressmember Marjorie Taylor Greene has said she's heading to New York to take part in protests against Trump's arrest. He will fly into New York today. After he's arrested, he is expected to fly back to Mar-a-Lago and, on Tuesday night, just after 8 p.m., is expected to hold a prime-time news conference from his estate at Mar-a-Lago, or at least give a speech. Invitations have already gone out to his supporters. We are joined now by Ellie Mistal, the nation's justice correspondent, author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. Ellie's recent articles include, Donald Trump has been indicted. Don't get your hopes up. Ellie, why not? We are. This indictment, which we still don't know all of the details about, right, to a conviction, to prison or real accountability is a very long process and one that we don't know how it's going to turn out. As you pointed out, Amy, Donald Trump is likely to be indicted for uh, charges relating to his hush money payments to actress Stormy Daniels in 2016, right? But 2016, that's an important date, right? Because the statute of limitations for campaign finance fraud, which is potentially one of the charges that is going to be in that indictment, is generally five years. That brings you to 2021. We are in 2023. So there are some timeline issues with these charges that we have to be concerned about that will and, and here's the important thing, Amy. There's nothing I know about the statute of limitations or the legal technicalities that DA Alvin Bragg doesn't know, right? And there's a lot of things that Alvin Bragg knows that I don't know. But everything that I'm saying is what Trump's lawyers are going to say. They're gonna be grounds for his appeals both before trial and certainly if we ever get to the point where there is a trial and a conviction. So these will be opportunities for Trump to further delay the process, delay accountability, and ultimately delay justice. Were you surprised by this indictment, both the timing, but also what you understand? Now, again, as you pointed out, it has not been unsealed. It could be unsealed at any point through to tomorrow when he's arraigned, when it's expected to be unsealed. Was I surprised by—I mean, I'm surprised this didn't happen in 2021. The, that Donald Trump uh, allegedly committed these crimes, it's basically a matter of public record, right? We know that he paid the hush money to Daniels. We know that he lied about it in public. It, 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 it's easy to infer that he lied about it on his business records based on the testimony of his former lawyer, Michael Cohen. So all of these charges, all of these uh, allegations have been a matter of public record for some time now. And I have yet to hear a credible explanation for why the Southern District of New York did not bring, that's the federal uh, 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 law enforcement body um, in Manhattan for why SDNY did not bring these charges in 2021 when Bill Barr, we assume, you know, uh, uh, did not allow uh, uh, charges to happen under his watch. But once Merrick Garland took over, why weren't these charges brought in 2021? And we don't have a good explanation for why former Manhattan DA Cyrus Vance didn't bring these charges in 2021 when the the statute of limitations certainly had hadn't run out yet. 
So the surprise is the timing of the charges, literally, not the charges themselves. These are things that we're we, we many of us have already kind of baked in that Trump, Donald Trump did the deed. The question is, what? Why wasn't he held accountable for that earlier when it might have been easier to do so? This is one of Donald Trump's lawyers, Joe Tacopina, speaking on ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He's gearing up for a, a battle. Um, you know, this is something that obviously we believe is a political persecution, and I think people on both sides of the aisle believe that, that it's a complete abuse of power. Um, he's a tough guy, George, as you know, and he's someone who's going to be ready for this fight. Um, we're ready for this fight, and, and I look forward to moving this thing along as quickly as possible to exonerate him. Your response, Ellie Mistel. First of all, Donald Trump is not a tough guy. He is a whiny little punk. And we know that because if he was a tough guy, he would not be crying about political persecution and everybody's out to get me. And oh, no, no, he would be like, I didn't do it. Let's go. That's what a tough guy would do in this situation. He's got credible legal legal arguments. He would make those legal arguments and have his day in court. Instead, he's like, the judge is mad at me and I can't get a fit. That's not tough. All right, so that's number one. Number two, the thing that these people on, on, on the right keep pushing, this idea of, like, if they can go after Donald Trump, they can go after you, too. Yes. Yes. If you pay hush money to an actress to cover up an affair and then lie about it on your taxes, they can, in fact, go after you, too. And, in fact, they would have gone after you if you were a regular person. In fact, the only reason why they haven't gone after Trump to this point is political, right? The idea that he's being prosecuted now, that he's being indicted now because he's the president, no, no, no. He hasn't been indicted already because of his political uh, stature and his political power. And now that, at least in New York, that's, that's coming back around on him. And hopefully, hopefully this is only the first of many indictments that Trump will be seeing over the course of 2023. Let's talk about his attacks. I want to get to the judge. Um, but first, uh, Alvin Bragg, uh, that picture that Donald Trump tweeted of uh, himself holding a baseball bat um, and a picture of Alvin Bragg, the first African-American district attorney. Look, Donald Trump always has smoke for people of color and for women who try to hold him accountable. We know the play. Everybody knows the play, okay? Everybody knows that he is going to try to dirty the waters, to try to trum, chum the waters with this racially aggressive stuff, right? We know that he's that 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 works for the exact same people, the exact same marks and dupes that gave this rich man four million dollars of their money over the last week are the same people that go in for this kind of racialized tension that Donald Trump creates. So we know the play. I don't think that that play, that old play, that play that goes back to 1850, I don't think that's going to work particularly well in this case. I don't think it's going to matter very much in this case. Alvin Bragg is going to keep doing what he's doing. We've already seen how he's responded to the ridiculous requests for testimony from uh, Jim Jordan and the MAGA Congress. We've already seen how Bragg's responded to that. I think he will keep on his path. I think um, Wait, Melly, Marshall. talk about that. For people who aren't following this closely and the significance of the legislative branch of Congress, of uh, the Congress member Jim Jordan, um, calling for Alvin Bragg to testify um, before his committee. Yeah, so I mean, let's go back to the Constitution, which, uh, which which explains that we have a separation of powers in this country. Uh, Congress is the legislative branch um, um, at the federal level. Alvin Bragg is a local law enforcement figure. There's no covalence there. There's no legislative purpose for Congress to bring Bragg in to uh, haul him up to Congress to testify about, remember, indictments that are unsealed, that, that are sealed at this point. Jim Jordan doesn't even know what he's talking about. And Bragg made that point to him. There's absolutely no reason for Bragg to show up and testify. He won't show up and testify. It, but it's, again, it's, 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 it's Trump supporters and Trump sycophants trying to muddy the waters um, with the appearance of impropriety. And again, Trump has legitimate legal defenses here. 
if he was tough, if any of his MAGA bros were tough, instead of doing all of this stuff, they would simply fight the charges as they are, right? Because they have an actual defense, but they don't want to make the actual defense. They want to do this chumming that we've seen. And, you know, Jim Jordan is, is, is one of the masters of that, of, of, of a person who abuses his power in Congress to try to advance MAGA causes. Alvin Bragg's not having any of that. I don't expect he 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 will. Um, but that's what I'm saying. I, I Trump will throw a lot of stuff against the wall. I don't think a lot of it will stick. Where he's where he's going to be benefited is from the fact that this will take a lot of time to go from indictments, let's say they're unsealed tomorrow, to an actual trial and and, and an actual conviction. Trump can most likely do what he usually does, which is delay accountability until uh, uh, justice is denied. Donald Trump wrote on Truth Social, his uh, social media platform, Friday, the judge assigned to my witch hunt case, a case that has never been charged before, hates me. His name is Juan Manuel Marchand, was handpicked by Bragg and the prosecutors, and is the same person who railroaded my 75-year-old former CFO, Alan Weisselberg, to take a plea deal, plead guilty, even if you are not, 90 days, fight us in court, 10 years, life in jail. He strong-armed Alan, which a judge is not allowed to do, and treated my companies, which didn't plead, viciously he said. Um, he spelled Judge Marchand's uh, name wrong, Judge Marchand, a Colombian-American. Um, talk about the significance of this. The, I, I can't, because none of what he said is true. Like, none of it is true at all. There's no, there was, no, what, that statement that you just read, Amy, is fact-free. Um, there, there, there was, there was nothing there. Um, Judge Marchand, to start with, was not handpicked by Alvin Bragg. It is a random system of signing judges in, in New York. Well, in this he case, though, Ellie, in this case, the reason that Marshawn got it, apparently, is because he did preside over the case of Weisselberg and the Trump Organization, and Bragg made the argument that this is related. And so it didn't go through the random system, but it went because he randomly was chosen for that case. Yeah, but Bragg didn't pick him. Bragg made an argument, and I'm saying that the random thing happened at the start of Trump world uh, uh, indictments, right? Uh -huh. So, like, Marshawn was randomly chosen for the initial Trump case, and therefore it makes sense that he's going to get all the rest. Bragg made that argument, but he didn't pick him, right? That there, there, there's no, there's no ability for a prosecutor to pick the judge that they have. I mean, maybe Trump, because of how he went through impeachment, thinks that it's usual for people to be able to pick their own judges, but that's not actually how it works, right? So. Bragg didn't pick him. Marshawn did not railroad Weisselberg into taking that plea. Weisselberg took that plea because Weisselberg wasn't willing to flip on Trump. And so Weisselberg took the weight for the Trump organization. That's how that went down. Like, there, th this, is, this is a normal process. Okay, I can't say normal because it's not normal to charge former presidents. But to the extent that Trump is being treated like a normal defendant, this is what normal defendants uh, uh, face all the time. And quite frankly, I bet a lot of other defendants would love to be arraigned and then fly back to their golf club and give a press conference about why the charges are bogus. That doesn't happen for a normal defendant. So Trump is already taking advantage of the system in all the ways a rich, powerful, wealthy white man can. The idea that the assignment, pro assi the assignment process is against him is, is just bunk. It's just not true. I mean, it's very interesting, the attack on Juan Marchand, because it reminds you of the attack on another judge, on Judge Curiel. This was when President Trump was running for president the first time, and Trump University was being charged with fraud. And Judge Curiel, um, Judge Gonzalo Curiel, was the judge overseeing that case um, against Trump University in San Diego. Um, Trump began calling him a hater, who was being unfair to him because the judge is, quote, Hispanic, because he's Mexican, and because Trump was building a wall. He put that all together. Again, that works for his base, right? That kind of attack works for the people who are already on his side, which is why I disagree with 
a lot of the, the coverage that's coming from mainly mainstream media, mainly corporate media, mainly both sides media, that, oh, charging the president will rip the country apart. No, it won't. It won't rip the country apart. Trump has his base of crazy people. And they will continue to support him, and they will continue to believe the things that come out of Trump's mouth. The rest of us won't. That is already baked in to the system. So the idea that actually holding Trump accountable somehow further divides the country, are you kidding me? We cannot be more divided than we already are, where we have 30, 35, perhaps 40 percent of people actually believing this man, and the rest of us believing in, like, facts and truth and physics. And Ellie Mistel, the call of a number of news organizations from The Intercept to CNN for Judge Marchand to allow cameras in this trial, that it is of serious public interest and the public is extremely interested. Your thoughts? I always believe that we should have cameras in the courtroom. Courts should be, you know, uh, justice is best done transparently. Courts are, 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 are houses of the public. I always think there should be cameras in the courtroom. I understand why some judges don't want them to be. I think they they always fear of the 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 way that the media circus can be can can be created from these trials. And again, you know, legal arguments are not. It's not like Law and Order, right? Like it's it, it they're dry and technical, and sometimes people who aren't knowledgeable about them kind of can get the wrong impression and take the wrong things. To take the wrong lessons from them. That's why judges resist having cameras in, in the courtroom. But that's that's an argument. It's not a dispositive one. It's not a great one, basically. Um, and I think in this case, as in every case, there should be cameras allowed in the courtroom. But it, but it ain't my courtroom, so we'll have to see. We're talking to Ellie Mistal. He is The Nation magazine's justice correspondent. And, Ellie, you wrote an interesting piece about another topic. Last Thursday, a federal judge in Texas blocked the Affordable Care Act mandate for health insurance companies to provide preventive care. Ellie, you tweeted, FedSoc judge in Texas gutted the preventive care parts of Obamacare nationwide, so now the party of forced birth won't force insurance companies to cover basic prenatal care. Um, Ellie, you have a piece titled, The GOP's War on Obamacare is Screwing Up Its War on Abortion. Talk about what's at stake here. Yeah, so the one of the most life-saving aspects of the Affordable Care Act is the fact that it forces insurance companies to cover preventative care. People forget, before the Affordable Care Act, it was actually very hard to get insurance companies to cover preventative care. So if you were poor or even middle class, a lot of times it was more cost effective for you to get sick because then your insurance would kick in. Trying to take steps to not get sick would be prohibitively expensive before Obamacare, right? So that was that's what Obamacare fixed. And of course, because conservatives don't like Obamacare and don't like that there was, you know, don't like the black person giving you health care. Why did that happen? So the Fed sock judges, this one in particular, Reed O'Connor in Texas, who has made it his life's mission to destroy Obamacare, have gutted that section. They're basically three agencies that determine what is preventative care or not. Um, uh, O'Connor gutted one of them. And that ta that's the I forget I'm forgetting the acronym right now. Um, but the task force that he gutted is the one that covers, among other things, cancer screenings, um, HIV transmission preventative drugs, and prenatal care. And the hypocrisy of these people who want out of one side of their mouth will literally force women to give birth to bring pregnancies to term against their will, but then won't cover won't force insurance companies to cover prenatal care. And we're talking about birth control, right? There is there are three organizations, one, there are three uh, 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 institutions that determine preventative care. The one that pushed the contraception man mandate, he didn't knock that one down yet, right? So there, one, one does what I'm talking about with prenatal care and, and, and cancer screenings. The other one does contraception, another one does vaccinations. The contraceptions and the vaccinations institutions, those were left to stand at this point so far. The one that does cancer and prenatal care, that one was knocked down by Reed O'Connor. So what happens next? 
Well, it gets appealed. I think because it doesn't just government... come out right away for people who are afraid because Obamacare is actually um, uh, forward funded, right? So uh, it, this funding is goes forward for a year or so before it could be that judge could be blocked. Mm, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the timing. Um, it, it could happen faster than you're saying. I'm not sure about the timing. But the point is that this will be appealed, and then we'll have to see if the if a higher court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, in this in this uh, situation, which is a extremely conservative court, whether or not they stay or block the ruling pending the appeal of the case, we don't know that yet. Um, hopefully, they do block it because this is a this is a again this is a judge who doesn't just have a history of trying to take down Obamacare; he has a history of being wrong. This is one of the few conservative judges that is so far to the right that even other conservative courts routinely overrule him. So one would hope that this latest conservative wackadoodle ruling is temporarily blocked until there's a full appeal where he will likely be overruled. Ellie, before you go, on Friday, a federal judge in Memphis, Tennessee, temporarily blocked a law signed by Tennessee Governor Bill Lee banning drag performances in public. Um, meanwhile, in an interview on 60 Minutes with Leslie Stahl, the far-right Republican Congress member Marjorie Taylor Greene said she stands by her claim that Democrats are a party of pedophiles. This is what she said. The Democrats are a party of pedophiles. I would definitely say so. They support grooming children. They are not pedophiles. Why would you say that? Democrats, Democrats support, even Joe Biden, the president himself, supports children being sexualized and having transgender surgeries. Sexualizing children is what pedophiles do to children. Wow. Okay. That was Leslie Stahl questioning Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's headed to New York to protest the arrest of Donald Trump. Ellie missed all your final comments. Yeah, Amy, I'm going to push back on the word that that was Leslie Stahl questioning. That was Leslie Stahl laundering Marjorie Taylor Greene and her wackadoodle theories. If Leslie Stahl had been prepared for that, which we knew that Marjorie Taylor Greene was going to say, Leslie Stahl should have been prepared to just come back with Denny Hastert, who's a Republican. The point is not Leslie Stahl. The point here is that Tennessee's drag ban was always bad law. It was always against the First Amendment. One of the things that these Republicans are trying to do is to directly attack the First Amendment when it when it suits them um, to try to push their bigotry against the LGBTQ community. It was obviously against the First Amendment. It was a good decision by a judge um, to over, to block it. And I uh, and even with our conservative courts, I expect generally uh, that law to not to to not pass muster and to be blocked all the way up to the Supreme Court. Ellie Mistel, I want to thank you for being with us, the nation's justice correspondent, author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. We'll link to your recent articles, including Donald Trump has been indicted. Don't get your hopes up at democracynow.org. Coming up, we go to Belgrade, Serbia, where we'll speak with former Guantanamo prisoner Mansoura Daifi, who gives his first television interview about how likely presidential candidate Florida Governor Ron DeSantis personally watched him be force-fed and tortured while DeSantis was working as a Navy attorney at Guantanamo. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As former president and 2024 presidential candidate Donald Trump prepares to be arrested in New York on Tuesday, we turn now to look at a growing controversy about one of Trump's likely presidential opponents. That's Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, widely expected to seek the Republican nomination for president. Prior to entering politics, DeSantis served in the Navy as an attorney at the U.S. prison at Guantanamo and in Fallujah, Iraq. DeSantis's time at Guantanamo is coming under scrutiny after a former prisoner named Mansur Adaifi revealed that DeSantis had personally witnessed him being force-fed and tortured. Other prisoners have backed up Adaifi's count. Last month, DeSantis denied authorizing force-feeding at Guantanamo. The Washington Post did a big deep dive on this today, actually, about what you did out there. One of the things they said was that you authorized the use of force feeding 
That's some of the true. yeah, that's not true. Yeah, uh, any of the stuff uh, that people just to finish saying, force okay. feeding the detainees who were on hunger strike was that true? So I was a, I was a junior officer. I didn't have authority to authorize anything. Mm. There may have been a commander that would have done feeding if someone was going to die, but that was not something that I would have even had authority to do. So that's that's wrong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was Ron DeSantis last month in an interview with Piers Morgan. But in an interview five years ago, in 2018, DeSantis admitted to CBS Miami that he'd authorized force feeding. I was a legal advisor. For those that were doing the things that would happen is the thing you notice the day you get down there is for these detainees, the jihad was still ongoing. Right. And they would wage jihad any way they can. Now they're in a facility, so it's limited, but some of the things they would do, they would do hunger strikes. And you actually had three detainees that committed suicide with hunger strikes. So everything at that time was legal in nature, one way or another. So the commander wants to know, well, how do I combat this? So one of the jobs of the legal advisor would be like, hey, you actually can force feed. Here's what what you can do. Here's kind of the rules of that. That was Ron DeSantis in 2018, as he was running for governor in Florida. Well, with DeSantis expected to soon launch a run for the White House, we're joined by former Guantanamo prisoner Mansour Daifi. At the age of 18, he left his home in Yemen to do research in Afghanistan. Shortly before he was scheduled to return home, he was kidnapped by Afghan warlords and sold to the CIA after the September 11th attacks. He was jailed and tortured in Afghanistan, then transported to the U.S. military prison at Guantanamo in 2002, where he was held without charge for 14 years, many of those years in solitary confinement. Mansour Daifi now joins us from his home in Belgrade, Syria. In 2021, he published a memoir titled Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo. Mansour Daifi, welcome back to Democracy Now! Hey, hi, Amy. Uh, nice to see you again. Good morning, America. It's great to have you with us. You're actually speaking to the world right now um, at democracynow.org. You were detainee 441. Explain your connection to the current Florida governor, DeSantis. Uh, yeah, that back to 2006. As you know, like, let me give a brief uh, introduction. So well, why we went on hunger strike in the first place? As you know, we were transferred to Guantanamo, spent a year, uh, years without, without any kind, like, until now, without kind, like, charges or rights and so on. By the end of 2002, General Jeffrey Miller arrived and he turned the, 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 the Guantanamo into an uh, experimenting lab. And the situation got only worse every month and every year. By 2005, we managed to organize, like, a mass hunger strike that embarrassed the U.S. government. The Kamba administration at that time tried to negotiate with us to stop the hunger strikes so they can improve the living condition in the camp. We agreed, but it was just they were buying uh, time. By the beginning of 2006, a new medical team, a new uh, camp staff arrived. One of them was uh, a young officer, a young handsome officer who came to talk to us and told us he was there to ensure that we were being treated uh, humanely. And we talked to them about why we were a hunger strike, what, 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 what were our demand. It wasn't jihad, as he said, like, and, you know, what people always try to turn our actions in Guantanamo as, like, a jihad or Al-Qaeda activist cell, that way you used to tell us all the time. So these were our demands, stop the torture. We were uh, asking for them uh, to improve the living condition in the camp, and he was talking to us and assured us that, assured us that everything will change and he will make sure that we'll be treated humanely. Only... Two months, only like, I think, even less, less only, uh, even less two months later, we were dragged to block, solitary confinement, different camps, different blocks. A new medical team arrived, and they start forcing feed us. And I'm not saying no problem with the force feeding. The, the use of, of the force feeding as a mean of torture. You know, I was taken to a uh, non farmer block in Camp, camp 2. I was tied to a force feeding a chair, like I couldn't move at all. I could only breathe. Guards bring piles of insure, and they started with the nurses pouring can of insure, insure one after another. Like the only way, like you eat, 
So during the feeding, a group of officers arrived with the uh, interpreters, with the interrogators, camp staff, medical staff. They were behind the fence. And I saw one of them was uh, Ron DeSantos in a, a military uniform. And he was, while, while I was screaming, yelling, because I couldn't breathe of the inshore, and was like, I was bleeding because they really insert a thick tube through my nose. So I, I was like calling them, asking, and they, he was actually laughing, looking at, at the other officers and smiling. So this is my first encounter, uh, second encounter with the um, Ron DeSantos. The first before the first feeding, he came to talk to us and other prisoners. Second time, I saw him like twice while on the first feeding. And like, I would like to hi highlight really important things here. He was there. He wasn't there like to give orders. He wasn't involved directly in, in the first feeding. I didn't see him giving orders to the guards, but he was there, like supervising, watching. When I asked other prisoners uh, who, who were also in the first feeding, if they saw him, they said yes. One of them, at least, he told me, he sent me a uh, message. He said he was there too. Mansoor, we're also showing images of your remarkable artwork, your drawing of being force-fed as you speak. But I wanted to turn right now to um, another former Guantanamo prisoner who Democracy Now! reached last week, Ahmed Uld Abdel Aziz, who also remembers Ron DeSantis at Guantanamo. He spoke to us from Mauritania. DeSantis. He was there, that person called DeSantis, because we didn't, we didn't recognize his name until we saw him in the media. And then, then we heard about he is now working in the Congress, a guard who was working, uh, you know, a very long time ago. Uh, for us, he's a guard, you know. For the government, he's a lawyer, and he came there. But he's doing the same thing as a guard, because he was cited. He was siding with the guards. He was siding with the administration there. He was part of that. He was the link of that chain, chain of involvers, people who were involved in uh, injustices, uh, wrongdoing, and uh, uh, mistreatment of detainees, uh, putting people, detainees, in degrading conditions, degrading uh, uh, locals because many of these blacks were not suitable for, for, for animals, not, not say about uh, humans. So that's former Guantanamo prisoner Ahmed Uld Abdel Aziz speaking from Mauritania. He was released in 2015. Um, and Mansour, you also contacted former Guantanamo prisoners via WhatsApp to see if they remembered Ron DeSantis. For our TV viewers, we're showing the screenshot of one of the people who responded to you who wished to remain anonymous. His message says in translation, quote, Yes, I remember him. He was in detention with a group of officers who hurt and tortured us a lot. May Allah publish them all. I assume it means may Allah punish them all. Um, can you talk further about how the force feeding felt? And if there were any guards who were doing this to you, or the people—you can tell us who they were, who were putting in these tubes—who uh, objected? You know, uh, this is different between the force feeding and using the force feeding as a mean of torture. I, I spent years on force feeding. Other, some prisoners spent between 2 to 15 years on force feeding daily. We get like, usually we get like twice a day, in the morning, in the afternoon or night. Also during Ramadan, they will do it like after sunset. Uh, you know, there was like medical professionals. They were like nurses, doctors. But in 2006, and if you go to, if uh, readers go to my book, I talked particularly about what happened in 2006. It was one of the worst years in Guantanamo, where DeSantis was there. They start punishing. They started by punishing uh, prisoners in Camp Five. Then they uh, tortured the uh, hunger strikes by force feeding. Also, Camp Four, uh, a medium security camp was raided and detainees were shot and hospitalized. Three detainees died at this year. Then. Uh, by the end of 2006, a new a new camp wa, 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 was open, like Camp Six. So, in 2006, when Ron DeSantis was there during the the the, 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 uh, the torture by the force feeding, 
they really brought uh, thick tubes called uh, Fran uh, 18 French or, two, uh, or uh, 25 French with the metal tip, and they just push it on our nose. Guards used to do that too, uh, because guards and and, and, camp and, camp and medical staff, sorry, were there doing the force feeding. Uh, we I got fed five times a day. They left me all night on the force feeding chair, and they give us some kind of laxative uh, liquid in the in the in the in the in the, in the nutrition uh, liquid. So while sitting on the on the, on the force feeding chair, we were in ourselves, and they left us like that. When they move us to solitary confinement again, they leave us only with shorts, really cold cell. And the second day they will start again, like leave us four hours. We couldn't last some for three days, five days, and we had to stop. So they ensure they bought like boxes, five boxes or more, and the the first feeding bag where they just pouring in shoe, care and ensure one after another. I felt I was really drowning. Um, on one of the first feeding, when I was like throwing up, yes, Ron DeSantis was there behind the fence and camp officers, they were behind the fence. When I was throwing up, the insurance was too much in my stomach. So I threw at them and they jumped back. They were killing themselves, looking at me. So I, I felt I did something at least, you know, uh, uh, worth it. So when, when, uh, on one of the first feeding, while I was throwing up, the tube literally came out of my mouth. I remember the nurse grabbed it from the, the tube and it's like, start to eat. You have to start to eat. So that lasts for me for five days and I had no choice. Like I couldn't last, either like die or stop the, 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 the hunger strike. And we stopped. Uh, I was first fed again in 2009, 2013, other, but that time they, they did it professionally and we had no problem. We, co we co cooperate, cooperated with them. The only time that force feeding was used as torture in 2006. There was also another in the other years where some medical uh, medical team they will try to pressure us, you know, like by to, to stop the hunger strike, but not as, as bad as in, in 2006. In 2006, lawyers for another prisoner argued that the military made the force feeding process unnecessarily painful and humiliating to break the hunger strike. Um, uh, at the time, something like a hundred of the prisoners were on hunger strike. Um, I wanted to ask you why you think that. Um, uh, Ron DeSantis, now the governor of Florida, has hardly mentioned his time, his experience at Guantanamo in his new book, The Courage to Be Free, and also ask you about his time in Fallujah, um, which is very interesting. Um, going back to Iraq, um, you have— um, he arrived in 2007, right after he was at Guantanamo, during the surge. According to the Tampa Bay Times, DeSantis served as a senior legal advisor to the SEAL who commanded Special Operations Task Force West in Fallujah. Navy Captain Dane Thorlifson, um, talk about the uh, legacy of Fallujah. First of all, he didn't mention much about his time in Guantanamo because we knew he was part of GTF and he was a legal advisor. And if you ask me, I think DeSantis is a cruel person. Um, I think I believe that his mission there was a cover up and uh, to cover up what had been in, uh, in 2006. So uh, about Fallujah, I don't think I'm in a position to comment in his time there. But for for what I have read and seen, that as we all know what happened in Fallujah, like. The, death of um, civilians using depleted uh, uranium and so on. So I would like to say one word to Americans, just watch out from that from that uh, person. You know, someone who be, be, bend the truth to serve his own uh, political uh, interest. Uh Mansoor, we're going to do a second part of this interview and post it at democracynow.org. You just wrote a comment is free op-ed piece in The Guardian about a Biden administration decision around the artwork of the Guantanamo prisoners. And we're going to talk about that and also show more of your images that you drew while in Guantanamo. Yes, Mansoor Daifi is a former Guantanamo prisoner, 
detainee 441, imprisoned without charge for 14 years and seven months before being released in 2016 to Serbia. We spoke to him in Belgrade. His memoir is titled Don't Forget Us Here, Lost and Found at Guantanamo. That does it for our show. Democracy Now! currently accepting applications for Digital Fellow. Go to democracynow.org for more information. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.